uh, thank you. Right. I would like to introduce uh, our studio topia panel. Welcome, Welcome to the Studio Topia Creative Question Challenge. The creative, uh, creative Question Challenge is a new brainstorming format where speakers explore and present creative questions in a 30-minute dialogue. It's very important that audience members understand that they can submit their questions as comments in the YouTube stream, YouTube stream and we will then take up these questions later on during this half hour. Studiotopia is a European initiative that invites scientists to work alongside artists to address issues of sustainability. The artists and the scientists that you see here today will work together over a 17 month journey and the journey starts today. I myself am Adrian Ekels. I work for the JRC, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, where I lead the SciArt project, which does things similar to these ones. Our speakers today are Shibon MacDonald, Shibon is an Irish artist uh, whose practice draws attention to contemporary topics dealing with air, breath, and atmospheric phenomena. She pursues knowledge to ask questions about the structure and history of the Earth across research labs, and her practice deploys a unique artistic language that gives form to intangible and richly varied processes, including painting. Our scientist today is Chris Bean, the senior professor and head of geophysics at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Without going to the details of his research, he is broadly interested in sound wave propagation and the origins of sound in the earth. The first question that I will pose both of them is, can unheard signals inspire change? Shivon, please. Hi everybody, thank you, Adrian. Um, well, signals have been around since the beginning of time. In prehistoric times, man used them um, to make vibrational frequencies to communicate across spaces and time. There are networks all around us, and um, we ourselves are massive sensory bodies within the sensory body of the Earth. When Edda Kuh volcano erupted um, in Iceland in 2010, sorry, I can't pronounce that properly, um, it was the people who lived around the volcano felt it in their body before the Met Office could pick it up. Um, so as part of our DNA, we can pick up these sign signals. Elephants communicate through their feet in times of threat. They form circles and they protect themselves by forming these circles and feeling the vibrations to their feet. Um, one of the great joys of walking in a forest for me is that when you give up any attempt to analyze what's going on, um, you know, particularly with the underground networks under your feet, you stop thinking with that part of your brain and you sort of give up and you sort of engage with the act of listening, truly listening. Um, Bruno Latour talks about it in Critical Zones. He talks about this layer of skin under the earth where all systems are connected and everything is part of one large social network. We really, really need to tap into this. Um, during COVID, I think during the lockdown, it's a great example. There was a silence that hit across the cities, across the world, and it resonated a different frequency. People developed sort of like a heightened sense of awareness and we became really aware acutely of our surroundings and these untapped senses that we have. COVID has helped us kind of realize that we live in a desensitized world. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is that all systems are connected. And these unheard signals have up until now literally started the beginning of a new language. Is that That's two minutes? Perfect. That's perfect, Siobhan. Chris, what do you say? Uh, thank Adrian. Thank, thank you, Siobhan. So following up on, on Siobhan's uh, points there, so... Um, during the during this uh, lockdown period, as, as Siobhan mentioned, the world went very, very quiet from a human point of view. So human activity really, really reduced. And then we were better able to hear signals in the earth itself and signals we knew we were that were there. But we got a better, uh, you know, we got we got some better access to those signals uh, during these quiet per periods. And, and what we can hear is, is a, a, an array of beautiful sounds that are coming from inside the earth. That we're normally not very aware of and these sounds are generated by the ocean interacting with the seafloor way out in deep water that ocean is blown by the wind uh, that wind is driven 
by the sun, by nuclear fusion reactions on the sun. And so we have nuclear fusion reactions on the sun sending ground wave vi vibrations through the ocean floor that come back to our land stations on Earth and, and vibrate beneath our, beneath our feet. So we have the sun giving us light with the sun also vibrating the ground really gently uh, beneath, our, beneath our feet. So we have this, it's an unheard signal um, but once you realize that it's there, and that's where the science comes in, science brings the instrumentation that allows us to hear these signals that, that we wouldn't normally know were there. And um, we can see a full uh, richness of the connectivity, as Siobhan was talking about, between uh, different systems on Earth and actually systems out into our solar system. So, and this is a point we'll come back to, this connectivity between all these individual uh, systems um, is, is really crucial for a deeper understanding, for a deeper feeling uh, about how, how the earth works and where we're going. Very good and very interesting. And now a totally different question. <laughs> Can only science save us from the ecological crisis we are confronted with? Chris, maybe you start first now. Well, just as, as I mentioned there, so we have these we have these signals. What science brings us is it brings us information about things that we might not otherwise see. Uh, because we are, we have filters, or otherwise here, because we have filters. Our ears can only hear a certain range of frequencies, but when we put out sci scientific instrumentation, we can actually hear more of the things that are going on. So what science does is it brings us more information. It brings us, uh, I guess, more knowledge about what the world, what's going on in the world, and reduces this, the filters that we're through which we're interpreting everything. But and so it reduces these physical filters, opens the world up to us. Um, but the question is then: Is that all we need? Do we need just this knowledge? And I would argue that knowledge alone is not enough. We can know things, and we might understand absolutely nothing. So my answer to the question is: Science alone cannot bring us. Uh, the, the deeper understanding that we need um, the, uh, to understand, to, to, to work through uh, the problems that are facing uh, the, the society uh, and, and the global challenge. Okay, perfect. Chibon, what do you say on that? Can you agree with Chris? Um, well, I think that's spot on. I have lots to add, though, and I can say absolutely not as the answer to that question. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting time to have a conversation about art and culture and the role of art in the world. We're seeing it right now as we've reached this tipping point in terms of what's happening to our environment. Um, I think art, art has shifted to be a more inclusive kind of movement. It can communicate the inexplicable. Um, it's sort of, it's like, it's, it's energy, it is alchemy, it goes beyond language and written scripts, it can reach into the neurons in the brain and the nerve endings, places that n nothing else can access. It is the ability to break down boundaries and borders into like a shared experience, just much like in tribal times, the way people would collect together to, to kind of have a shared experience. We've lost all of that and we've lost all those senses. But what we need to do is to, to access the emotion. And I think that um, art can do that. Um, it can convey something, you know, in a difficult space, a space that you can't really occupy so easily as when you're a human. Um, it, it addresses lots and lots of questions about changes. Um, we're in such a high risk at the moment. I think we need to do things we've never done before. And a really good example is uh, um, Oliver Eliasson's Ice Watch that was exhibited at uh, Place du Pantheon in Paris in 2015, where in response to the, the COP23 uh, uh, thing that was going on, he, he placed in the shape of a human clock, or sorry, a global clock, he placed uh, huge blocks of ice that he, he'd gotten from Greenland in the form of uh, the 12 hour clock. And People responded to that artwork in such a visceral way. They, they went up, they could actually feel the coldness of the ice. They could see it melting. They were presented with this clock and they started to make this connection between the mind, the emotion and the universal in a, in a really short space of time. It was a very, very powerful comment. And there's so many examples like that where people from all walks of life are able to engage with it in a very subliminal way. I have to interrupt you here, Siobhan. I'm sorry. That time. <laughs> That was a good one. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't know if there is a question from the audience. Uh, I don't see anyone. Any? 
uh, but then I would suggest that we go on, uh, having mentioned Atour, uh, we have talked about science that is uh, cannot give you a deeper knowledge. We to have talked about art that is more inclusive and get, can go beyond words and uh, and concepts. Uh, if we keep a Latourian sh uh, scheme, then what is missing here is society. And Latour at a certain point says that art and science must go together to convince society to do something. Do you think that we have made progress on that the last decades? Are people more aware of what is happening and of the need to contrast global warming? What do you feel in your own life? So, uh, may I come on, on, on this one, Adrian? So, I think, uh, I think uh, Latour, he, he introduces a very interesting concept, and that is that the speed at which ecology needs to be what he calls domesticated. And this is the this is the key issue. Over society has developed over long periods of time, but the the ecological crisis has come upon us at such a such a, a neck breaking speed that we haven't had time to what we might call domesticate the problem. And if we domesticate dogs from wolves, that didn't happen in one generation. So we need to accelerate in some way the domestication of, of, of the ecological situation that we're in. And that cannot be done through science alone. That needs to be done um, through art. Art has to work, in my view, on the social filters that act against that type of domestication. Um, so that it, it, in that sense, uh, we have a huge amount of work to do, uh, and, but I think we are making progress, but uh, in, in my view, art is absolutely critical uh, to that end. Siobhan? Mm. Yeah, well, I think uh, I, I agree with what you're saying, Chris. I think art is vitally important. I mean, we have undone 50 uh, million years of evolution in just 50 years, and the timing of this event um, is has been sort of as I say, it's been sort of like um, a cesarean section, you know, in terms of life terms uh, of the earth, and it's been way too quick. So I don't think uh, our human brains have been able, or our sensory equipment has been able to catch up with that acceleration. And so um, we're on the front line, you know, us that are alive now, we've chosen to be alive at this time when we're, we're actually walking in the front line of this, and we have to think quickly and we have to... Uh, I think one of the things we have to do is look back in history and look uh, look at how people got themselves out of massive atrocities. And a lot of it seems to be collectivity and emotion and going back to the basic elements of actually connecting with the natural world, of the cycles in nature that we've lost touch with completely. We're so urbanized now. We, we, we hardly know unless somebody tells us, you know, um, what's going to come next. We're so expectant of that. I think we're in danger as well of this, uh, of the computerization, this mass kind of slowing down of our brains because we don't really think for ourselves. We've got to get back out there and get our hands dirty and plant some trees and, you know, get into forests and, and listen to what's going on. Um, there are huge opportunities at the moment for us. And I see this as a great opportunity. Um, and I'm 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 really vitalized by it, you know, and I I, I love Bruno de Tours, um, thinking he is. Uh, there's many many different philosophers out there at the moment offering so many uh, different um, ways and pathways ahead. Of the, it's a kind of like an evolutionary time. So, yeah. Yeah. Chris, maybe you want to to react to that. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with with what Siobhan is saying, and I think we. One of the challenges is, from my perspective, is that, you know, we need to move beyond um, beyond a human centric world. And I think that this is a key. This is our this is our key challenge, in my view. I think if we if we stick with a very strong uh, human centricity um, in society, then then we're probably not going to make it in terms of our deeper understanding, our deeper connection. And Sean, as you want to talk about connections, and I think connections are absolutely important. We need an emotional connection with, uh, with, with ecology to help us, as, as Latour says, to help us domesticate this ecology, that it becomes part of who and what we are, not that it's something we're viewing from the outside. We all have the knowledge. Most of us know what the issues are, but we haven't, in some sense, taken them, taken it inside us. It hasn't become part of our everyday. 
of, of, of every day who we are. Um, we're still very human centric. And I think that, that the challenge from, that I see for art is to figure out or to not necessarily solving a problem, but the process of, of, of uh, de us developing a less human centric view uh, uh, of the place in which we live. Mm -hmm. That we would have to do then too at a break, neck breaking speed, not to be neck breaking speed. It's a huge challenge, yeah. It's not a uh, human centric thing, even though lots of people are talking about this. Huh? And the first thing that I've read is the contrat social, the social, the sorry, the natural contract by Michel Serre, who already published this in 1990 and proposed the parliament of being. No? where all the, the creation, uh, what, whatever is on the earth, would have a voice. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, it's since 1990, it's not that we made much progress there. There is some progress, but it is too slow. Mm -hmm. Yes. On the other hand, I have also a study here from a rethink uh, think tank that says that the next 10 years, everything is going to change. Do you think that is possible? That it really, that we have a kind of, uh, rapid change and that in the, in the next 10 years we really have a breakthrough would COVID help there or not what do you think um Siobhan do you want to uh, in the next a breakthrough I don't think we've got any choice I, I think we have to um gear ourselves up for a breakthrough on every level I think that's um the choice has been taken away from us completely and as Chris mentioned to me a couple of days ago I mean COVID is just a leaf inside a massive forest of a problem you know this is just one tiny pocket of this problem we've been articulating for the last five years together um uh but it's been around since the industrial revolution we've known about what's going on you know we've totally uh derailed the natural processes um, of nature, um, we're outside of nature now. So, um, we, mm, I yeah. would agree. I think we need a new worldview along the lines we've just been discussing and Adrian was discussing there. But we need that to use a modern term to go viral. We can see what happens when a virus goes viral. So we need that. I, we need those ideas to go viral such that people will look back and say, you know, I can't believe that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people thought that this was OK. Um, and we that but that is the challenge. How does one accelerate that? So the climate climate crisis is accelerating. Um, we need to accelerate our change of how we view the world in tandem with that or it will run away on us. Yes, but how do we do that, Chris? We have to tap into, uh, I don't think we can do it with our brains, uh, you know, it can, on its own. I think, I think, agree. I, I, I agree. don't think we can do it with technology. I, certainly for what you, the kind of work you do with mapping what's happening in the world, it's vitally important. But I think uh, as a sensory uh, inhabitants of this world made up of five senses, we're actually made up of a hell of a lot more. Uh, just like I was talking at the beginning of the talk about this, these sensors that we have, we've got to wake those up again because we're asleep and this sleep, sleeping state has brought us to where we are. And um, the machine technology has, has completely sort of dulled us down in many ways. And the speed at which we get information off the internet has scrambled our brains, you know, and we've got to start thinking for ourselves. And a lot of that is in plant technology. You know, if we actually can observe nature and slow ourselves down, you know, and and um, and slow down to the beat of things a lot more instead of just waiting on this kind of vibrational, you know, feeding from the speed of social media and everything else that's going on. You're we making can... me curious now, Shibon. Is that what you say about the plants? Is that the result, the direct result of your own practice where you do work with plants? Yes, it's my own practice um, in my art and it's my, my world view as well. And it's a lot of the practices that I would engage with as a person. You know, I'm interested in Buddhism. I'm interested in nature. I'm interested in vibrations, just as Chris, we spend hours, Chris and I talking about listening to nature, listening to beats in the earth, you know. And as you do that, you realize that you're part of that system, that your heartbeat actually is part of the heartbeat of the earth. And if we start listening to that beat again, we will be more in tune with the actual vibrational rhythm of what is holding the universe together. That's and that, I think, is key as humans, that we align ourselves with that. Yep. It's, it gives me the idea of a, of a 
of calming down. Of yeah, the, of slowing absolutely. Down. Anyway, it's time to sum up. Uh, from what we've discussed, uh, what would you think is the real question now? We put two questions or some more. Oh God. <laughs> hey, change your idea about what what is the question that you that we have to pose. What is the question that you are going to take on your 17th month journey? Maybe. What am I? Yeah. You, she won't. My 17th month. Oh my God. To open. Um, to be really open to everything that comes along, to, to have a very open mind, to not just have one question, but to question absolutely everything. Um, to use this time of, of adversity as an opportunity, to turn it into an opportunity to rethink our relationship with the natural world and how to, um, uh, how to reboot ourselves in terms of everything, you know? Um, I'm still thinking, Chris, you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess for me, it's, you know, how do we turn the scientific knowledge into a sense of consciousness, almost subconsciousness? How do we, how do we, instead of it just being an external thing we know, how do we bring in that, con that, that consciousness? And I see a question coming in from, from a YouTube channel and a, a random citizen, what should they do, in, in, you know, to, to get it? To, to start this journey, in my view, it's exactly as Siobhan saying, genuinely, this might sound a little bit woolly, but go for a walk in a forest, but stop, watch, watch the animals, watch the creature, this is where they live, these are their homes, their habitats, everything, and look at them as really, really important, you know, bring them right up close to you in terms of, you know, your level of how you regard them as creatures on planet Earth, and we're sharing this planet with lots of other creatures, and that's extremely important. And it's very simple. You can see it in your forest. You can see it by the coast. You can see it anywhere. And it's a, slowly then that becomes the way you look at the world. That would be my view of a starting point. Okay. So if we have to put it into one question, what would you say? Do we have one question? Oh, that's a beautiful scheme that we see. It's beautiful. I say let's have some fun. <laughs> and let's remember what it's like to be, you know, happy. It all comes from there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, getting serious now. What is one question? One joint question or one question each? The question that you two want to bring forward. I think, I think the question is, you know. Have we lost Chris? Yeah, I think we lost Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's me. Oh God. Um, what would you say is, is the one question? Can we use this time as an opportunity to reboot ourselves as human beings in this world? Can we use this time as an opportunity? Of adversity as an opportunity to, to reboot, reboot how our, our place in the world, we reboot, reboot how we view our role as as a as an inhabitant of this of the earth. Can I can I add to that uh, our place in the world, giving more space to uh, the other creatures? Yes, bring. I'd love to bring in the other creatures, like the elephants and everything else. To nature, to nature, to other creatures, including trees, of course, and, plant, and yeah. plants. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, it's a very, it's it's a big pity that um, that Chris was not able to formulate his question. I hope that we can come back to this, and because I'm very curious to what he was uh, yeah. starting to say, yeah. yeah, and I am quite convinced that it would have been interesting for our little discussion. Yes, is this? I think he's got. I know. Mm. Is he coming up again? I don't know. He fell. No, I don't think so. Uh, with this format, unfortunately, it's a very nice format. It's a tough format for the speakers, uh, Shibon uh, MacDonald and Chris Bean. Uh, I thank them quite a lot. Uh, I hope that this beautiful scheme that uh, the people in the studio made can be sh uh, published somewhere on the Studiotopia site. It is uh, quite clear that this is a discussion that has started today, but that will go on in the next months. And I would invite all of the people who are following this to keep following Studiotopia and to see what happens when in 17 or 18 months uh, the results are coming in. And we can maybe know a little bit more about this rapid change that we are expecting, that people are expecting, 
about the work that Shibon and Chris will have done themselves uh, together. And I personally am looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That was. <laughs> Are we still on the screen? I don't know.